All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of C-Mask. I'm your host, Mike Pantile, joined by the Culture War Crusaders, Tim Gordon, Nick Stumphauser, Nolan Knows, Will Noland. How are you guys doing this morning? So good. Doing well, Mike. Excellent. Caffeinated, sugared yeah, up, ready dude, to go. Same here. So in case, for those of you that don't know, we switch who leads these podcasts each week. So we vary up the content to add a little bit more flavor and variety and depth. So hopefully everybody enjoys that. That was actually a bit confusing when I was a listener of, of the podcast. I'm like, where is this actually hosted? Who's hosting it? <laughs> Nevertheless. So today we're getting, we're getting into a topic that, um, uh, it just, it's a thorn in my side. And it was something that I actually did early on in my content, quote unquote, creation career career. And so those topics are the reality of female sin and how the church ignores it and this serve the wife content. And you get it on kind of both sides. You, on the secular side, it's this divine feminine, divine masculine stuff. All these guys are making gobs of money. And it's this idea that, you know, if a man was just masculine enough, a woman would be able to just, ah, uh, you know, just, just become just feminine and obedient and submissive and all that stuff. And in the, in the faith-based circles, you get this serve the wife servant leadership, like, cuck yourself and simp yourself for your wife invert the leadership of like bro you know you just gotta love your wife like christ loved the church man which in modern terms and christ is not wrong about that but in modern terms that means just become a, a doormat and just allow your wife to steamroll you and just a shout out to dr david edgington i believe that's his name he wrote a book called the abusive wife and i think he was like a christian psychiatrist or psychologist that saw this a lot where like these well-intentioned good men would show up for therapy and it was just, it turns out that the, the women were just reviling wives. It's an interesting read. Everybody should should definitely check it out. So on that topic, right? And it's really, it's really interesting. You know, you address male sin, everybody cheers. You address female sin, everybody sneers. Okay, so what do you guys think? What are your thoughts? Do you agree or disagree? If a man was just man enough, a woman would be able to finally be feminine and submissive. Is it about just a man loving his wife like Christ loved the church? Is it that simple? What do you guys think? Start with you, Will. Depends what you mean by man enough. If it is just that he goes out and earns some money and then makes it so that his wife can stay at home and she rules the roost and he thinks that happy wife, happy life is the way things are supposed to work, then no, that's going to end up with both of them being unhappy. And anyone with even a rudimentary knowledge of what scripture says about the dynamic between the sexes can see why it's that Eve after the fall has a desire to rule over Adam. She's always going to want to control. And unless Adam can say no and set boundaries, then disaster is going to follow because Eve isn't really built to lead. So in a nutshell, I think that's the problem with the approach that you've outlined there, Mike. I'm not surprised that Christian psychiatrists have found that it causes marriage chaos yeah it, so what i mean by that just to kind of expand on that point is like there's this expectation on social media particularly on instagram that if a man was just i, I call it fabio on the horse showing up with flowing locks and just this like masculine embodiment of a man <laughs> it takes like this perfect archetypal man for a woman to finally be feminine and submissive when re we realize we understand you know um that and this is a controversial statement wives are to submit to their husbands regardless of their performance Agree or disagree? Agree. Agree. When you get married, you submit. Yeah. Agree. So, Tim and Nick, I'd be curious to hear starting with you, Tim. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, you know, the performative? If a male just shows up the way he's supposed to, basically putting all accountability and responsibility on him. What are your thoughts? I was going to make this exact point that the Christian reiteration of the the perfect provider Fabio model, which is the secular iteration. The, the baseline man requisite to garner a submissive stay-at-home wife for seculars. Well, in the Christian sphere, it is that precise fallacy, uh, colon. If he was a perfect man like Jesus, then I would submit, and I would do it so enthusiastically. <laughs> this is like saying, I'll, I'll submit when pigs fly. No man is Jesus. No man could be Jesus. And no Christian is admonished to act like this as a husband or as a wife. How Christians are admonished is 
Wives, submit to your husband in all things except grave sin. This means even in maybe silly, fleeting, ephemeral prudential judgments that the man makes, the wife must, must follow him. It's implied even in venial sin. Perhaps the wife must follow him. But but particularly the, the bad prudential judgments, because that's what I get asked a bunch. I know Will does too. What if my husband said to take the the you know jabby jab uh that's a prudential judgment it's, it's just a silly one if he's on the wrong side of it but you still must submit in all cases at all times aside from grave sin not only if he's a great provider and his breath smells like scope in the morning when he wakes up and he rides in on a white horse and his locks are oh so vidal sassoon not just then but in any case if he's your christian husband you must submit. And the, the, the other point I was going to address really fast is that what you were discussing before, Mike, is um, essentially the question, who is, which is the party, men or women, that are now going to be tougher to turn away from feminism? And this is an obvious answer. Yes, men have lent to it. We do say that. Our friend, a uh, friend of the show, Andrew Wilson, Paleo Christcon on Twitter, makes this point excellently. Whenever you talk about female sin, there's a phenomenon that'll be top top side volley returned to you. But what about what about the Mendo? Uh, I agree with all that. But the point is there if feminism has created an adversely interested party, beneficiary class, which is women, they're going to be more loath to give it up than men, even though yes, men have been cucks and have tucked and have done all these things which have lent to feminism, they are the non-adversely interested party to keep feminism going, men, unless you're talking about some kind of sleaze, coomer, red pill way. It's it's women that are, as a class, adversely interested, and they're like, hey, we we like this, okay, let's keep it going. So, good question. Yeah, now Nick, we know why thoughts? Tim has Vidal Sassoon locks. I was just going to say, that Vidal Sassoon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> reference just slid in there. Beautiful. I thought the that was like, oh, you have to, bro. You is that a to. vocab <laughs> word? Is that a vocab <laughs> word that I should know? What is this? What it's is like that a word? It's like a 90s reference. So oh. you you wouldn't be born for another like 12 years until the year. Okay, Zoomer. One. Okay, <laughs> Zoomer. <Yeah. laughs> when were you born, Nick? Like 2016? <laughs> yeah, 2016. <laughs> yeah, Trump just came down the escalator. <laughs> yeah. Remember nine no eleven? Nick's like, oh, th that's what you dialed for emergencies on your rotary phones, right? Yes, so like, yes. It, it was also an event. <laughs> Sorry, right. funny. All right, Nick. I know you know you're going to be a future patriarch, but I'm sure you got thoughts on this. Well, yeah, because coming into the to the scene, trying to become a patriarch, trying to become a husband, it's it's. I'm I'm the one presented with the like, oh, Nick, the reason you're not married the reason why your trad wife sir hasn't been administered to you on a platter is because i'm not vidal sassoon <laughs> whatever the hell that means um you know i'm not i'm not sufficient and so the 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 internet takes great pleasure in articulating the ways in which i'm i must be insufficient because i don't have the trad wife and um i i've experienced in both romantic and non-romantic women partners in my life or, or just interactions that if a woman is feminine, if she has garnered enough virtue to overcome her concupiscence that, that even parted, um, and she engages with me with femininity, which is to say she wants me to be masculine. It creates a very rapid positive feedback loop where I, almost instantly become the man that I wish I would have been or didn't even realize that I could be. And then she gets to settle in even more into her femininity. And I don't think women realize that they have this, this power to inspire in a man the exact kind of behavior that, that they claim that they would submit to. It takes almost nothing. And Tim and I have kind of talked about this in obliquely in other senses that like if you just give a man hope or a little bit of praise or a little bit of orientation of, of like, I'm, I'm appreciative of you in some way. Like the man will crawl over broken glass to do whatever it takes for you. 
And like women kind of aren't getting it. The internet's not not grasping this. Like you have to come correct already to get this. It's not the case. If a woman does the bare minimum, like even if you're not um, married yet and you're not living together, let's say the guy is working. Does she show up with lunch for him? She she listens. She paid attention. He she knows what, how he eats. Maybe he's a lifter and he's got specific macro requirements. So she's seen him make chicken, broccoli, and brown rice, carrot salad, carrot salad. If you're a Ray Peter like me, <laughs> and she just makes that and shows up at your work and gives that to you, a little kiss on the cheek. What do you think that man would do for her? He he would go slaughter nations. To, to provide, to protect, to love on that woman. And I think like 99.9% .9 of men are in that position. He would figure out how to be a masculine man like instantly. Right. Uh, the, the, the thing we have to be careful of though, too, is I totally agree, is that, you know, if a woman, you know, a lot of women will say, yeah, I want a man to be a man, but a man according to her standards, not according to God's standards of, of masculinity. You get this, and I know Tim, I want to hear Tim's fiery thoughts on this, this really... Uh, cucked idea of mutual submission and so you see this and so like the gas and brake pedal of feminism is like man up and then shaming you when you're too much of a man so like you get those those that that <laughs> alternate back and forth so guys like ah and because he's trying to live up to her standards of what a man is and and by doing that you're inverting obviously leadership that's not how it's supposed to go so mutual submission is that even a thing tim we'll start with you it's a contradiction in terms. I always tell uh, folks who listen to Focus, which is Catholic missionaries on campus who push mutual submission hard, or Father Mike Schmitz, mm. or any of the mainstream Catholic voices which push this canard. Well, I've never seen a, a head-on collision on the road, but I have seen the crash site. And after a head-on collision, one thing that I've always noticed is that it's usually a bigger car and a smaller car. I've probably seen it four times in my entire life. And one car always goes under and one car always goes over. Now, that actually, that's not totally true because one or two of the times I've seen cars that are of about equal height and they, they actually just go into each other and it's extra, extra messy. But if you have a higher car and a lower car, one goes under, one goes over. That's how it works. They can't both go under. Mute, that's that's literally what it means to be mutually subjected, to be thrown under. Both can't go under. It's like the old football uh, drill where you have three guys and they're weaving. They're doing the, the dive roll weave. You have to go under. You can't both go under at the same time. To go under, something has to be above you. So it's clearly a... a a lie, even as it fails to suffice as a spatial metaphor, and it doesn't work in the Christian household. They're, they're pushing this lie in order to say, well, everyone submits, which really means no one submits. It's an absolute lie. The expression mutual submission appears zero times in Scripture. It appears zero times in the patriarchs of the church, the patristics writings, and it appears zero times in papal writings. Even I'm talking the 20th century where eight writers weighed in on submission and they said, women need to submit, wives need to submit. So scripture, tradition, magisterium, none of them say mutual submission. You have one throwaway line and I think love and responsibility or the letter to women by JP2. After JP2 has admitted women need to be home and, and he doesn't like it, but they need to be submissive. He says, well, in a sense, St. Paul admonishes men to subject themselves, to submit themselves in one, one single sense. In all senses, women must subject themselves to their husbands in all the other ways. Uh, all St. Paul meant was men must sub submit their lives if they're stopped by a band of robbers on the road. So in one mm -hmm. sense... There is a submission by the man. It's a submission of his life. But in every single decision-making discretionary authority in their lives, 
even JP2 admits, yes, the woman must submit in all ways. From this, you could talk about a mutual submission, even though it's not in scripture, tradition, or the magisterium, and not really being lying, except you're casting it in a false light. You're saying the women, the woman who is married submits in all ways at all times, aside from grave mortal sin, orders to commit grave mortal sin. The husband does in no ways, aside from the fact that he's ordered to protect and to submit his life, should it ever come due, it's forfeit. Yeah, it's a metaphor. Metaphorically, men submit their lives, but literally, historically, women every day must be submitting themselves to their husbands dozens of times. So it's it's a, a filthy lie. And um, I've called out Father Mike Schmitz and, and focus on this. And uh, they don't want to play ball because liars don't. People who are fibbing, let's say, do not like to be called out on their fib. Tim, would you correct me on my metaphysics here if I'm wrong? But it, I'm pretty sure the idea of mutual submission violates both the identity principle and the principle of non-contradiction that two things cannot both be the same thing in the same way at the same place at the same time. And it's uh, basically codified. The idea of mutual submission is inherently gender dysphoria because it's saying that there is no difference between a man and a woman. There's not an A and a B. It's two A's or it's two B's, and therefore they're interchangeable and should both be occupying the space of the submitted. Sure. It violates the principle of identity, because it, it is positing two specific essences, two, two, two species of two different sexes, man and woman, as if they're one. And because these two have opposite complementary functions, and you're saying that they should be as one, act as one, ergonomically at least, if not ontologically, it's gender dysphoria. You're saying that men should do something that's essentially female. It is essentially male to be active and female to be passive, male to be expressive and female to be receptive. I could go on in these couplets, which define male and female, even in the lower animals. And you would quickly see, yes, it's gender dysphoric. And of course, in the way I describe uh, with the spatial metaphor, both cars can't go under this uh, to go under something implies some uh, what's called grammatically an indexical. Uh, the preposition under implies something is over, or else the the inherently relative comment has no referent. The reference has no reference. Same thing if you say over, there has to be something under, and you are and you are violating the principle of contradiction if you uh, attempt to gainsay that. So yeah, it's 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 just a lie, and it violates all three principles as you. Um, Name Nick. What it what it really is though, right, is just a way of pussyfooting around obedience. Because what they want to get across is their key point is that the wife does not in fact have to obey the husband. What they have to do is, well, maybe just obey each other, or maybe there's no obedience at all. And when you think about the first feminist convention in Seneca Falls, as Tim outlines in his book, The Case for Patriarchy, 1848. They want to throw off wifely obedience. And that's what mutual submission achieves. And you don't even need to look at Revelation to realize what a stupid idea this is. Just as a blunt fact of anthropology, even in non-Christian societies, there's never been a matriarchy in all of human history. Patriarchy is just reality. And Aristotle writes that the relation of male to female is of ruler to ruled. Now, Christianity can clarify that a bit more and say specifically it's about husbands and wives within the natural law society of the family. But everyone can see just from looking around that men run things. When I got sacked for my lecture on patriarchy that made this point, a pig farmer, old pig farmer, retired, wrote to me and just said, this is ridiculous that you got sacked for this. Anyone who questions this principle hasn't worked with animals. I can tell you that when I've got my pen full of sows and then the big boar comes out and roars, they all submit straight away. They know who's boss. There's no question about it. And you can see it in the animal kingdom and it's in the rational animal kingdom of human beings too. And we can explain why it is. That's well said. The only thing I got from 
Jack Donovan's way of men was the bonobo monkey point, where I think the bonobo monkeys is like one of the only you know species of monkey or animal in general that's that's matriarchal. And so what is the byproduct? Um, well, men laying with men, women with women, and everybody sleeping with one another. It's almost kind of, you know. Uh, well, don't bonobo monkeys masturbate all the time too? Yeah, that too. So it's like, isn't that? It's such an interesting narrative on, on <laughs> like West, the only the West species that does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, yeah, and you, that's there's the fruits of it right there. I mean, come on, I mean, you're seeing it in, in culture right now. But yeah, patriarchy is inevitable. So okay, the thing is, why does the church blatantly ignore this topic? I've been going to church for a long time now, coming into the Roman Catholic Church again. Praise God, but. Protestant church churches, Novus Ordo masses, which is what I'm used to. There's really no dis discussion around the nature of women at all. And I, I, I can't lie and say some of my earlier content on Instagram was kind of geared in this way. If the man just shows up, the women will show up, but it, it it's clear that this is not true and it's not biblically sound. Is it as simple as the church just, well, one of two things either being so infiltrated by feminism it doesn't know its asshole from its hole in the ground um or being afraid of losing their tithe what is it tim it's it's a step worse than ignoring the truths of christian patriarchy which are central to the rules of vocation for those who are of holy matrimony rather than of holy orders is one step worse. It's actually covering it up. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing if if one of your kids forgets to do the dishes, but then if you find evidence later, one of the other kids is like, no, we reminded them. We reminded them. You guys were out at dinner, mom and dad. We reminded, uh, you know, Mags to do the dishes, and she purposely covered her ears. Then it's like, well, that's even worse. That's what the church has done over the last 50 years. 50 to 60 years, same same kind of time frame, the span over which the church, I can speak to Catholic stuff, has covered up all of its true yet tithe-threatening teachings, all of its confrontationally, thornally Christian teachings, the church has covered over. But I can I can tell you this, this is not speculative. I already provided the example of what, what's basically being taught the falsity on, on every Newman Center in every campus uh, across College America, but more to the point, in most Novus Ordo brackets, when the reading of Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 25 comes up once every two years, the way that the, the new missile works, it comes up once every two years, it is in the missile bracketed. And priests are encouraged not to read it because it's some some bullshit like that they that they make sound okay. But this this isn't really true anymore. You know, this was just something we shouldn't do. It would be impolitic to be read. So that's hard evidence of the church's own embarrassment of riches, embarrassment at her embarrassment of riches. It's like everything else in the church since around the time of Vatican II. Anything that's true, if it's true and unproblematic un, un for every woman sitting in the pews, then then that's fine. But if it's true and problematic, got to go. Mr. Noland, Mr. Patriarch himself, will you and Timothy actually probably share that title? Um, what, I mean, Tim, I mean, I think you spelled that out beautifully. Um, what do you think, man? I'm kind of racking my head around this. I'm like, okay, well, as in, in the Catholic Church, you have the papacy. It's inherently patriarchal, but there's just like this blatant, like, turning of the eyes completely or plugging of the ears. Ephesians 5. I haven't heard a single church speak from Ephesians 5 in my time of being a believer. And that's more time than being an unbeliever. And it's just, it's very telling. Um, why? Well, if you think about what's gone wrong in society at large, and how feminism is a symptom of both male and female failure. Tim makes the point that Adam and Eve were the first feminist couple in a way. We can point to all kinds of ways in which women are the problem. 
we can also point to how men are the problem. And I think that's a good lens for thinking about the church through, because if the leaders of the church aren't actually willing to have the fortitude to say the hard things that people don't want to hear, all it means is that more men in particular get turned away from Christianity because they want to hear the truth. They don't want the soft, easy, feel good stuff. So society at large is in crisis because the church is in crisis. And you can't really understand the history of the West unless you understand that the Catholic Church basically built Western civilization. So when something goes wrong in the church, specifically regarding masculinity and patriarchy, then it's not long before the whole culture goes wrong as well. Yeah, and that's why you're seeing sort of like a mass, maybe not a mass exodus of the faith, but there's a lot of people converting to um, Islam because at least from a surface level, people don't really understand the doctrine itself and the Quran itself, how fallen it is. It's it's very appealing because it's very patriarchal. It's very strong. It's very, at least, you know, in the outward appearance. That's I, I think that's probably why Tate chose it. Otherwise, maybe he was paid. Um, very masculine, and it's appealing where you look at the Catholic Church or what, you know, the faith in, in general, it kind of seems airy-fairy almost in a way. I mean, even within uh, the Christian faith, obviously you got Protestantism, you got Orthodoxy, and you have uh, the Catholic Church. More men are drawn towards Orthodoxy probably because of the aesthetic associated with it. Maybe it seems a little bit more patriarchal or, you know, masculine or whatever. It's just, it's very, very interesting. I don't know if it's always been, if it's always been like this, but there's, there's uh, men are drawn toward this aesthetic. And I think, yeah. go ahead. My, Tim. I call this um, Miyagi complex. Like in the West, when the West denies what made it great, which is Jesus. And then Jesus is one true church. That's what made the West solve this side of the eschaton. Anyway, all major problems, the Roman Catholic church. When the Catholic Church goes into an embarrassment of its riches mode, mm -hmm. then old, old, old white people are no longer faces of wisdom for their younger generations, the, the grandparents out in the burbs when they go visit their grandparents. You have this incredibly hollow experience that most of us grew up with, mm -hmm. reflected very well by um grand torino you know the the white relationship of grandfather to granddaughter in in grand torino it's like this is this is bad um miyagi complex means that well hey look what's going on in the orient or even among asian people here in the west there's still an endemic relationship for their elders and in general older faces bear some wis wisdom like mr miyagi when we we cover up what's great about the West, then there are, there are things that are attractive about the East, you know, but from, <laughs> I don't know, Wu-Tang Clan rapping about Buddhist temples and Kung Fu and shit, that's kind <laughs> of cool. It's not, it's not nearly as cool as Jesus and the Roman Catholic Church, but when we cover up everything that's great about us, all eyes will be averted toward the East where there's still some cool stuff they haven't covered up their light in a bushel basket. It's the best they have. And you, you get this worship of, of Buddhism, Oriental things, and the kind of filial piety that, that tends to still be alive in the East. And it appears to be, you know, a bunch of Westerners in the Western Hemisphere looking to the Eastern Hemisphere. Well, it happens even within the Western Hemisphere. It's like, okay, Roman Catholicism has gone into a period of kind of turbo apostasy. The Eastern Orthodox churches have not so much, and they are more Eastern. It's always been Rome, the West, Western European version, Constantinople is the second sea in the East. They always had a, a kind of more Eastern bearing and more Eastern Oriental mien in terms of their emphasis on apophaticism and mysticism and the desert which was always cool. It was a cool, legitimate Western Christian thing. It was just the Eastern West, the East meets West. So it also makes sense that even though they're still Westerners, they're the most Eastern like, and that's why guys are like, I, I don't want to do the poser Muslim thing. I'm just going to go Eastern Orthodox. It's an aesthetic. 
if I could be, go ahead, Nick. I didn't want to get too far past the um, question of why the church is not answering or not even speaking on the subject of female sin and feminism. Tim, what's the number one rule of feminism? Never for any reason at any time say anything negative about a female. And there was a period of time about two years ago when I was, we'll just say in a very suggestive state and I was interacting with a woman and I, I like said a joke and then was able to very closely pay attention to what happened inside of me. And it was terror that the joke that I had said would make her mad mm -hmm. and something clicked in my head. And it was that myself and I would hazard a guess that a lot of a ton of men, maybe the vast majority of men conform their speech and their behavior to simply not break the f first rule of feminism, never offend a woman. And given the concupiscence that women want to rule over men and that knife in the ribs that Satan did in the garden of pitting them against each other, I think the, the greatest shit test that rings through the epochs is feminism. Do you men have the courage to offend all women? Because it's inherently, patriarchy is inherently offensive to what? To their concupiscence, to their sin nature. From the beginning, there was a brief period of time before the fall where that wasn't a problem. And now for the rest of history, until Christ comes a second time, to be a patriarch is going to offend women. And that's the greatest shit test we ever have to do. Very true. I had a tweet recently that went kind of stupid viral and got ratioed by all the crazies and ended up on two subreddits because I talked about how I'd have to approve of my daughter's future husbands in courtship. Tim, you and I are in agreement there, not in some boomerish like, hey, you've got to ask me to marry my daughter, son, um, in which I could just say no arbitrarily. But and um, it was basically about vetting their future husbands and going from my household to their household. I mean, that's that's patriarchy in a nutshell in this in a statement almost um and the wrath that came from women in calling me um oh, i mean i'm not even gonna say the terms on youtube but all kinds of child groomer child abuser all of these things um talking about my wife and in, in, in such anyways it just explicit disgusting uh insulting terms we we're so used to in this culture kowtowing to, to to the female emotion that you say anything to the contrary this is exactly what happens they kind of attack you like a viper and so my my question is well how do we other than what we're doing on social media running our families and our businesses how do we correct this like how does the church correct this is it just a problem that's going to just further metastasize into culture and society and we're kind of like riding the decline while we try to keep our families in this tight knit patriarchal uh unit like what what is what is the solution how can how can we fix it i, I want to hear what w will's answer or N mm -hmm. nick and will's answer is i won't answer this one i'm actually very curious to hear their two answers but i would just say the response will always be one of two things that that you fetch it will always be either calling check this guy's internet history right that yeah, kind of thing yeah. oh which i i was getting that yesterday from a tweet i did late last night also calling out female misbehavior maybe talk about that at the end or the opposite where they're saying you're 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 not fit to be lived with number one you've committed outrages or number two they'll they'll call you phobic or are you a <laughs> blank phobic and you're like i'm not afraid of it it's just gross it's fucked up i know it's i won't this is not fit to be lived with doesn't make me a phobic mm -hmm. okay so i just wanted Will, to say go ahead if we focus on what we can do as men, then it's to do with fortitude because what effeminacy involves is being deterred from saying the truth because you're too worried about the reaction you're going to get. Yeah. So that, to put it in the red pill terms, means a loss of frame or a loss of honor because you're basically cucked at the intellectual level because you then decide that you're going to operate within the feminist framework. 
And this also means if we translate it into thinking about Christianity, that we're no longer really keeping God's commands. And scripture tells us that we must keep God's commandments, for this is all man. So masculinity means being willing to correct this effeminacy in our families, societies, and ultimately in the church. So it doesn't matter if a priest gives a homily about the importance of stay-at-home wives and obedience and gets blowback from the parishioners who don't want to hear it, who find it offensive. It's actually loving to offend them. We know that ears will be burning and itching for false doctrine. You don't give it to them. That harms them spiritually. Instead, you say the stuff that makes the demons screech and that causes them pain because that's what heals people. Mike, we know that truth hurts at first, then heals later. This is exactly right. what needs to happen on a cultural level. The alternative is going to be bad for everybody. Well said. Well said, Well, Nick. I want to make the problem a little worse before we make it better. And I don't know what the answer is. So I'm, I'm just going to describe the depths of the problem as I see it and then kick it back to you three um, for hopefully some, some hope. When God created everything, after each moment of creation, he called it good, which for goodness itself is the highest compliment that can be paid to the creation. Mm -hmm. And then after he made Adam, Adam was good. But the very next thing he saw, Genesis 3, 2, was that Adam was alone. And that's the first thing that he said was not good. It is not good for man to be alone. So he made Eve. In, as a result of industrial revolutions, gynocentric society, civil rights, whatever you want to call it, not civil rights, uh, women's rights movement, women can survive without men. And they, they don't need men for protection or provision. Uh, we, we, we see this with the girl bossing and OnlyFans girls paying cash for houses and all these things. It's it We're basically superfluous for the traditional roles now. And in that time, the last 50, 60, 70 years, men at large have also been on the receiving end of I would argue the, the greatest form of feminine manipulation and, and pain point pressing, which is withdrawal. Because they know inherently, maybe not consciously, but they know inherently Genesis 3, 2, which is that if man does something I don't like and I withdraw, he will be in agony because he's alone now. And that is not good. And so I think there's a sheer terror involved in, in a real terror involved in breaking the first rule of feminism, because then the question that rings loud is, what if she goes? Mm -hmm. And this has got to be so scary for men who are already married. What if she withdraws? What if she doesn't give me sex, right? Which is a big deal. What if she files for a divorce, takes the kids and half my cash? What if, as a, as a guy, you're dating a girl and you really like her? What if I start asserting my authority and she breaks up with me or gets offended or starts talking about me online or makes a TikTok and says, my boyfriend said, I don't want me walking around outside in yoga pants. Look at this putz. Or as a single guy, what if I put my foot down and say, I'm going to live by this code. And then I can't enter a relationship because there's no women who want to be that way. That's scary because it's the deepest wound I think for a man. So what do you guys say? How, how do we overcome that fear? The risk of not doing it is greater than the risk of doing it. Yeah. The, 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 the risk of not exercising your authority and your leadership is way worse, not only on a micro within your relationship, but on a macro, on, on a societal level. Um, Will, you're going to say something. Go ahead. The, the, the false assumption in what Nick's saying, what Nick's saying is logically sound, but there's a premise there that, we don't have to accept, which is that women don't need men. They can earn a decent living through OnlyFans or whatever it might be, but they can't actually have fulfilling lives. 
without men. Most women who live in that way, imagining their girl bosses because they have a decent sized bank account. By the time they hit middle age and it's just cats and wine, they realize that actually they have squandered their youth. They're deeply unhappy. And women now are more depressed than ever before in history, despite having bigger bank accounts. So men need to remember that although it isn't good for man to be alone, scripture also teaches that the woman was made for the man, not the man for the woman. And I take Nick's point that loneliness can be a scary thing, but I called my Twitter uh, Be Her Leader. And one of the concepts that I try to get guys to understand is that if you need her, you can't lead her. And yep. by that, I mean neediness in that you're afraid and you have to simp to her and then submit to whatever frame she brings to the relationship because you're too afraid to be alone. Now, once you actually hold that, once you hold your ground there and you remember that she's made for you, not vice versa, it becomes a bit like a game of chicken. But the problem is that most modern guys are chicken. That's the whole point. They're too chicken to say the truth. They're too chicken to stand their ground. And you can win this because natural law is on your side. Divine positive law is on your side as well. And it comes back to, do you trust God's word? And do you have faith that this can work? Or are you already defeated and cut by despair before you even step foot on the battleground for the future? So it's oh, dude. interesting. Incredibly well uh, said. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, I think it's it's a brilliant point because it, it outlines once again the difference between patriarchy, which is Christianity, and the red pill, which is Luciferianism. Because and I'm I'm thinking of the um the parable of the rich man who built all the grain houses and filled his his houses with grain because the red pill's response to what you just described, Will, that game of chicken is uh, plate spinning because mm -hmm. you don't you don't have to be worried about you don't have to actually play the game of chicken because you actually have grain houses full of grain you have other women so you'll never actually be alone versus christianity which is okay who are you relying on actually well you're relying on god and those those things you just articulated natural law positive divine law is is scripture accurate yes so once it's again to be a Christian is to be a courageous, submissive to, to Christ, faith-filled man. And to be in the red pill requires absolutely no courage whatsoever. It, it's but, a faith problem, too. It's a big faith problem. You know, when I read the church fathers, it's such a sobering reminder of, like, how little faith I have sometimes. You know, we were talking about some of the anxieties that overtake us, you know, whether it's financial or health or, you know, whatever it may be. And so these guys are so afraid of, of standing up to their wives and and maintaining patriarchy in their homes are afraid of losing them. And it just reminds me of uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch writing letters on his way to martyrdom to be consumed by the beasts. And it's such a sobering quote, like, allow me, do not stop my martyrdom. Allow me to become food for the beast because that is my you know quickest path to God. And I just, every time I read that, I read it like multiple times a week because sometimes I need that punch in the face. To be like, yeah, I ought to have more faith. And so it's impossible to have a well-ordered oriented marriage and household if you have such little faith and if you're not if you're in your wife's frame and afraid of her walking away if she's going to walk away you let her walk away and understand and don't let your 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 faithlessness your despair cuck you you know well you had a really good uh story on instagram a week a week or two ago and you said you know god ultimately is the provider so don't emasculate yourself in anxiety mm -hmm. tim go ahead man Wow. Um, I can't, I can't one up what you guys said, but CS Lewis gave us the playbook. Anytime you're afraid to let consequentialism supplant operation by principle. He said, if you put first things first and second things, second, you get both. If you put second things first and first things second, you get neither. Mm. And it's always true. It's just always true. You always do what's right according to what's right means it's according to nature. That's the natural law. And if men are supposed to lead and uh, one man is supposed to find one woman who is well-suited for his leadership, 
because God designed nature according to that principle, then follow that principle and following the principle is doing the first thing because of its rectitude, its trueness. And you'll get the things that you want. That's the second thing, Nick. And and all of the people I know that attempted to put second things first and happy wife, happy life, that's all it is. They have horrible marriages and horrible lives. And I'm, I'm very sorry to say, and I, I know you already know this, Nick, but it's, it's most marriages you come across, whether they're Protestant, yeah. Orthodox, Catholic, or secular. So you have enough counterexample to know, not that you're considering doing it the other way, you're not, but no. first things first, second things second, you get both. It just might take a little more looking around. Then that's, I'm talking more to the guys out there that are situated like Nick that watch this podcast. Most of them are single guys. Yep. I'm talking to you, not Nick, because Nick already knows it. The other, it the other thing like, is that, sorry, Nick, you go. I'll make it quick. It seems like there is a failure of imagination and or hope then in the red pill ideology, which is that they think that the entirety of a relationship then is to just be with a person and then have sex with them. And that's kind of it, as opposed to what we're proposing is that if you take this gamble, there's there the upside is is absolutely um unequal to the downside yeah and the point i was going to make is really similar to that which is that marriage isn't like a lifestyle choice that you get to craft in your own way i think the liberal mind finds it really hard to understand that it's the the first command that adam and eve get after the fall and marriage is something men are commanded to do by God. Pretty much all men, a few are called to celibacy, but pretty much all men commanded to get married, have a family and serve God that way. And you don't get to make up the rules for how the thing works. Aquinas describes natural law as God's signature in nature, in human nature. And this is what marriage truly is. And you have to go into it knowing that. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It's like if you get a car and try to run it on water rather than fuel, you're not going to have a marriage if you don't actually run it according to the way the thing's been designed for what its main purpose is. So it's worth remembering that if you're going to do it, you do it properly and you burn the boats and just forget about this idea of spinning plates and pussyfooting and putting it off. Because when you start the spin plates, you've already admitted defeat. You've already entered the feminist worldview. We know what it means in practice. It means fornication, contraception. It means the embrace of the sexual revolution. Where exactly do you think that road is taking you after you take your first few steps on it? Nowhere good. Think it through to a conclusion. Hmm. But bro, don't I have to love my wife like Christ loved the church? I, you know, this is one of those things I, I, I need us for us to break this down. There's so little conversation about what this actually means and so much uh, uh, bastardization of what it means. I've seen it, I've seen it in men's groups. I've seen it in my coaching um, uh, business. I'm sure you have as well, Will, where these guys are like, but dude, I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church. And it, it's essentially just means they're a doormat. They're in their wife's frame. They're enslaved to their emotions. The wife is leading in sort of this really weird concept of servant leadership that is not biblical, and it's not how Jesus would have treated the church if the church would have misstep. Would Jesus allow the church to steamroll him? I don't think. I don't think so. I think there'd be a really stern yet loving correction. So, okay, loving your wife like Christ loved the church. Where do we begin with this? But you can probably start with the fact that Christianity can get summed up in a way with repent and believe the gospel or you're going to hell. And <laughs> Christ, that's basically it. Christ. Done. End conversation. <laughs> and Christ's top concern is saving souls. And that means being truth with a capital T. He can't teach error. And this is what infallibility and indefectibility is about really with the church that it can't lead souls to hell because it's Christ who's teaching us through it. And when we think about what it means for you know Christ to serve the church, it's actually 
holding it to the truth and doing what's right for it. It's not about saying stuff that feels good to hear in the moment. Sometimes it can actually feel hurtful to hear because it wounds you given your attachment to sin. And a husband has to be willing to have those hard conversations with his wife as well. Otherwise, he's actually failing to love her, failing to serve her. He's been a simp instead. Something that just popped into my head as well is comparing like, okay, well, Christ did a lot of things. And his main reason for being born was to die for our sins, right? But he had a ministry first, which is how he established the church and loved the church. And then he ultimately died. But it's like, well, why did he have to die? Uh, he, he even says it on the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. There, there was a group of people who knew exactly what they were doing. But on the whole, his death was unjust. It had to be unjust in order for it to be redemptive. The man who did not sin took upon the sin and died. Okay, so then how does a husband love his wife. Well, she's going to hurt you throughout your entire marriage. She's going to be imperfect. And how do you love her? You die to yourself. You take every single one on the chin, every single Eve moment where she's trying to rule over you, and you die to self repeatedly over and over and over again. That's how Christ loved the church. Not by, oh, I'm right. I'm right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steamroll you. It, it, but this is, this is nuanced because it's hard because when you hear that, like somebody is going to say, well, OK, so you're saying that you let your wife lead. It's death of self, not not abdication of authority. Christ maintained his full authority in his death. If he didn't have authority when he died, it wouldn't have meant anything. I, I don't have all the words for it yet. Did you guys see the. Tension that I'm trying to set up here. Maybe somebody else can take over that point. Yeah, it gets instantiated like Cinderella Man, if you've seen that movie. If you're in the Great Depression, you're the authority. That can't be abdicated, like Nick said. But if you got six slabs of spam and seven mouths to feed, you're the one that doesn't eat. And, and, and you're the one that has to go hump a shift. Because mm -hmm. you want your kids to, who are growing to, you know, not be deficient on protein. And, you know, that that it's that kind of thing. It doesn't mean you're not in charge. It doesn't mean that the wife doesn't submit. It right. just means that it's a prudential judgment call. You you, you probably should eat and the, the wife should probably be like, well, you're going to work. Here's two thirds of mine or something like that. But it, I'm just saying. That's not cucked when when Russell Crowe does that as the patriarch of his household when he's like, here, here, Janie, you you take mine. He gives his daughter a second because she's really hungry because a man knows fasting's good for him. Little kids, it's actually not not great for him. stuff like that. But it, that he's still totally the patriarch of the home, and it's one of the most beautiful, most recent expressions, cinematic expressions of patriarchy. That movie, Cinderella Man. Renee Zellweger is all with with one major lapse in that movie, almost a perfect patriarchal wife. She she does a really good job. I mean, there's no question who's running the show. There's no failure of wifely admiration, and he's not a servant leader of the Kennard brand of focus. Newman centers on university campus. Father Mike Schmitz. There are no lies happening where he's abdicating his authority. Uh, hopefully that's just a, a kind of picture thinking way of fleshing it out. Yeah, definitely. And it, it shows that love and service is about willing the objective good of the wife, of the children. And to come back to Nick's point about dying to self, it doesn't mean loss of frame. It doesn't mean not keeping God's commandments. In many cases, based on the guys that I've worked with, it actually involves putting your desire deep down to actually avoid doing what's right because it might be too confrontational to you, too hard for you or make you feel bad because it doesn't fit with your nice guy image. That's how you have to die to self. You have to die to your own inclination towards effeminacy and to actually just go 
have a beer and watch the game instead of have that conversation that you're afraid of. So you die to that weak version of yourself and you actually say, I don't get to make the rules. I have to do my duty here to live up to the standard that Christ sets for how I'm supposed to behave in the marriage. And if you don't do that, you're missing out on what marriage really aims at as a not a natural institution, just aiming at procreation, but as a sacrament, aiming at the sanctification of both spouses. This is actually how you become a better man and how your wife becomes a better woman. You both work towards sainthood by rubbing away each other's rough edges and imperfections. I heard this described once by a priest who was really smart and said that uh, you are your wife's uh, sucker, as in like you know, support sustenance, but you're also her suffering. So marriage is about both. You, you're you a cross to bear in some ways for your spouse, and you have to just expose your weaknesses to each other and work through them together. And you can never do that if you're afraid to actually follow what the rules are laid down by God. And he's promised he's going to help you do it as well. That's the bit that I think is most effeminate. It's people actually doubting that it's even possible and that God will help them. I think I've got the rest of the words for it. <clears throat> the buck stopped with Christ. It couldn't stop anywhere else. It had to stop with the person of Christ. He had to die. And in the family, you're taking it all upon yourself. The good, the bad, and the ugly, the sin, it's all your responsibility as the patriarch. That's your cross to bear. And you have to, you have to love your wife as Christ loved the church, which is to say, be the ultimate responsibility. And who has the ultimate responsibility is the man with all of the authority. Yeah. Part of dying to yourself means uh, not just sitting back and um, uh, giving into the sin of passivity, which 99% of men do. And that's why their marriages are inverted or in chaos, which leads me to the last question, which I'm not sure what your time is like, Will. Um, this last question, you hear this talked about online. Are men responsible for the sins of their wives? And how do we make that distinction between fault and responsibility? Interesting question. And if you think about the way that the even the old secular laws under more traditionally patriarchal societies used to be. So a, a man could go to jail for his wife if she got into debt, for example. They were one legal entity and everything stopped with him. Even her bad behavior and swearing, etc. within the community, that was basically his problem. That's your wife running around behaving like that. Aren't you going to do something? So there's that element to it. And I think that most guys don't really want that to come back. They they quite like a more feminist setup where they can say, she's accountable for her own behaviors. Nothing to do with me. I've got no real leadership or authority there. She's an adult. What are you talking about? My wife's an adult. However, if you look at scripture, it's pretty clear that both Eve and Adam get blamed. God mm -hmm. holds both of them accountable. And as Christians, I think that's the position we need to take. Do women sin? Of course they do. The same seven deadly sins apply to women as they do to men, just as the same cardinal virtues do as well. There's no special set of sins. So feminism involves women behaving in a way that is contrary to God's commands, but it also involves men doing the same thing too. And I don't really hear many people making both points. The red pill tend to say that it's all female behavior. Some of the more trad con Christian voices say it's many just men need to man up. But the nuance is actually it's both. And feminism involves both sexes getting things wrong. What do you guys think about that? A distinction is needed. You, you, you provided it, Will. But before you provided it, a distinction was needed between looking at legitimately bad female behavior like um, this this Twitter meme that's gone around, the, the little video of of the girls dancing at the gas station. I actually wanted to see what you guys thought about that this this past week, oh. where it's bad female behavior, and then someone looks for the nearest man to blame, 
This is what Andrew Wilson calls what about the Mendo? Hmm. That's not what you're doing. You're just saying, let's not do it in reverse. What like, which I really like. It's very, very important that what patriarchy says is Eve did sin first, all the patristics agree, but this was a sin by omission on Adam's part. It was it's, Eve committed the first commission sin. It's a sin by Adam of omission. And I think it comes from Bug's life, the proposition that when you're in management, everything is your fault. That's not what about the Mendo. The what about the Mendo stuff that Andrew Wilson is always rightly criticizing involves a denial that, that the man is actually the head of the organization, denial of mutual, uh, denial of submission and all of that. But just looking arbitrarily to blame the nearest man. What we're saying is now criticize women often. Uh, they're the agent of the evil, but men are the nearest husband is the one that can actually be blamed through an act of omission. I think that's really, 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 really important. And you, as always, um, well threaded the needle there. But that's why I, because I think one of, our C masks back. We had someone saying, Oh, doesn't this vi in the comments saying, doesn't this violate? But what about the men that we're like, no, 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 no. Andrew Wilson agrees with us. He's a, a patriarchalist. So he he's with us. We're not doing that. We're we're saying, yeah, Eve sinned by commission. Her husband did, in fact, sin by omission. And it's a bit like what St. John Vianney says. If your kids go to hell, likely don't fear you'll be there to greet them that doesn't mean necessarily they have their own free will it's not impossible that a, a, a an offspring or a, a wife ends up in hell without the husband but it, it's really hard to imagine it for the reasons well adam braid it so true i'll just my last thought on it tim you kind of gave words to what I'm still struggling to piece together. Maybe in a future episode, I'll have a more eloquent way of putting it. But yeah, like when you're in management, it's all your responsibility. That's kind of what I mean by Christ is the where the buck stops. And so he had to take it all upon himself. And it, if you, the husband, are like Christ loving the church, the buck stops with you ultimately. And <clears throat> that means that the only way that can be true is if you have the ultimate authority, if you are a patriarch. And Ayn Rand has a really good quote where she says that you can ignore objective reality, but you cannot ignore the effects of ignoring objective reality. So you're the patriarch whether or not you assume the role. So you're responsible whether or not you assume the role. And so what, again, it comes down to a courage thing. I think guys fear and i've talked about this before i think women think that the patriarchy discussion that most guys like <laughs> we get to dominate now now we will be the tyrants and it's like <laughs> that's not at all how i feel about it i feel the burden of responsibility i don't want to tell the woman that i love no no more than a parent wants to tell the kid and like, no, you can't have this toy in the grocery store. And they just like their world breaks and they're so sad. Like, why, why do you want to hurt the thing that you love and say no or correct them? Like what parent actually delights in harsh discipline of a child? None, unless they're like a twisted up person on the inside. So it's not uh, a delight for tyranny. It's a burden of responsibility to be a patriarch. And Loving your wife as Christ loved the church is so much more an act of faith, the death of self, a, a demand of courage and suffering. It's not um, a crown where you have your, your, I mean, it is a crown because you are the monarch, but it's not uh, a tyrannical dictatorship. Exactly. And that idea that heavy hangs the head that wears the crown is an important one because in a sense, patriarchy is a burden, especially for a guy who's the sole provider of a large family. And the great thing about it is though, that Christ helps you bear the burden 
like the real king of patriarchy is there to strengthen you. And it's actually how you learn humility because you realize that you can't do this. So we can't even keep the natural law perfectly by ourselves. So you just develop that humility and you have to have confidence in God that he will help you walk this hard road. In the Bible, when we see Jonah, for example, saying that he can't do what God is asking him to do and then gets told off for this. Well, you know best. Don't be ridiculous. None of you have to do this. You got to go. It's the same thing for modern guys facing marriage, thinking I I just can't do it. This is impossible. Uh, there's too much divorce. It's too difficult now. It can't be done. Like, don't be so proud. You don't know best. You need to have faith. And people are saying, but that sounds too Christian. I got to have faith. What were you expecting? There's no such <laughs> thing as secular marriage, really. Anyway, that was just stillborn. It's not dying. It was stillborn. So are you all in or not? Beautifully said, Will. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. And to bring this in for a landing, I think that was a great, great conversation. Patriarchy is power. Patriarchy is inevitable. To finish off the point, too, uh, a man is responsible for his wife's sins in a way that a CEO is responsible for his employees. He's not at fault, but he's certainly responsible. Those employees, your wife, still have to bear the burden of repentance and answering to God because in honoring you, she's honoring God. Do you guys agree with that statement? Of course. I, I would I would just say I, I know Will Will has to go, but I wanted I really did want you guys to weigh in on something. Oh yeah. Because the topic today is female misbehavior. Hmm. What should patriarchy bespeak on behalf of shame and shame culture? Like that that's that's why I wanted to bring up this most recent social media iteration, uh, reiteration of female misbehavior, just weird, weird sexual dancing to like sex rap lyrics at a gas station that uh, apparently happened recently. Like what boomer Vichy cons from the burbs have been out saying, they're like, oh, this is just girls having fun. You're a weirdo and you need your internet history checked if you're mad or you're afraid of this. I'm not really mad or afraid. I'm just saying like, these are hoes. <laughs> And we need to shame that doesn't mean I'm didn't ruin my day or darken my my hour a, a little bit. These are dead eyed, uh, culturally bankrupt suburbanite hoes who <laughs> are the product of dead eyed suburbanite Vichy cons boomers who say, don't get married young. And I, I, I used to teach the children of a bunch of these people. They're, they're even in a politically conservative area. They say, don't get married young, go out. Travel, that means have sex. Have fun, <laughs> that means have sex. Go to college, that means have sex with strangers. <laughs> and they're the ones, this is why I pushed back really hard on the shame culture. That's the one answer to this. It's like, I'm not mad and I'm not scared. We need to shame these hoes. And Mike, this is also why uh, me and you are like, we're in total agreement about, yeah, my my you got to get my permission to to begin courting my daughter. But once you do, it's like, if I allowed you to court my daughter for the first month, then it pretty much means that I think you're good. And I, I hope you ask her to marry you. The sooner, the better. Shouldn't take a year. Um, I was just checking that we were on the same page with regard to, yeah, a boomer dad from the burbs is the last person I'm going to ask permission to marry. I, I never, I mean... With all due respect, I would never have asked Steph's dad, no matter what. This isn't impugning him. He's cool in a lot of ways. But, um, yeah, you never want to ask a boomer dad permission to marry the kid because he's going to say, no, this guy's too Christian. That's what most boomer conservative, Vichy conservatives are, are going to say. They want their daughters out there hoeing at the gas station, which is literally what this video was. Did you guys see that video? And, yeah, and shame I'm so tired of seeing it, man. It's like, where are the dads? And I totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Where are the dads? Where are the patriarchs? There, there, there are none in those homes, clearly. Um, shame is a virtue in the modern West. And I think we need to bring it back. I think the only reason why this, this, this has become so bad is that we've stopped shaming women for being whores. I mean, that, that, that's it. I'm in total agreement. It's uh, this boomer culture, this, you know, go out and see if the shoe fits. I've heard fathers actually say that to their daughters. Honey, you know, you just have to see if the shoe fits. You're like, wow. I would rather actually kill myself 
before I said that to either one of my daughters. Legitimately, I'll just go and martyr myself before I said anything like that. Like, I, come on, man. Anyways, yeah, shame is a virtue. Bring it back. The way, the way that works, though, is that mothers influence the sexual morality of daughters far more than fathers do. Mm -hmm. That in, in Shakespeare and plenty of other classic literature too, you get this presentation of the tyrannical father who is the one that's trying to stop the daughter having sex. There's some truth to that, but really the studies show it's that the mother has the main influence. And what's the man's role there then? Well, it's in handling his wife properly. So she actually models that virtue and the daughters can learn from her. So sure, the patriarch does have an impact, but via the mother, first of all, and if he's just letting her run the house and work outside the home and dress inappropriately or the rest of it then has a knock-on impact on the daughters so it does come back to the head of the household in a sense it's just crazy how the buck always ends up stopping back at the at the father and it's always it's not what about demendo it's just it's a fact of reality it's it is the buck stops with you so um that video was funny wasn't it the dancing girls it reminded me a bit of in some African tribal ceremonies when all the young women in the village come out and just shake it in front of the guys as like an official ceremony. And the guys well, just watch and they're like, I quite like her. I like her. And then it's just made into a formal right. But in the West, it's like, well, we, we, we're heading in that direction, but we don't really want to admit it. That's yeah. <laughs> that's, that's well said, actually. <laughs> I'd prefer it if it was just made official and they had a set day for it. Rather There's than it just a... being unspoken at gas stations. Yeah, because it robs the Vichy cons who are everywhere trying to counter shame the shamers of their plausible deniability. Like, you just <laughs> hate fun. It's like, what is this, Footloose? The movie Footloose? Like, I'm not the mayor that banned dancing. This isn't dancing. Okay, here, li listen to this. How about someone out there that's defending this? Print the lyrics of the song that they're dan yeah. dancing yeah. to and pantomiming. Do that for me. And, and get and then, your Twitter account removed. And then look at who wrote the song, the cultural influences surrounding that entire genre of music. And then do me a favor, just look into the architecture of the businesses that promote and produce and distribute that music. And Will's point starts to make a lot more sense as well. Uh, I'll just let everybody do their own digging on all that. And to bring this all the way back to the beginning here, yes, we should shame women for being hoes. <laughs> Why? Because if they, if women get that uh, pressure applied to them, then perhaps they will start acting in a feminine, more feminine way that will inspire young men to act in a more virtuously masculine way. Simultaneously, if men become chads and use weaponized chastity as tim talks about in the case for patriarchy then the women are going to have two points of pressure on them to say hey this is how you should be if you want to get a chad not this is how you should be because wag your finger if you don't want to be alone if you want your heart to be full if you don't want to be 30 with cats and wine this is how it's got to be i agree but the shaming of women has to come primarily from women because Young historically man. that's the main way in which it works. Even things like female genital mutilation, which you can read about in anthropology studies, that's mainly something that's enforced and carried out by women. Most men are actually wow. opposed to it. But foot binding as well in China after the emperor's bandit, the women were like, no, we've got to carry on binding the feet. You can't ban this. This is important for us to be able to control our daughters. It's mm. the women who drive sexual shaming of women. And that's going to be a hard one for guys to approach unless it's via wives and mothers who get the job done for them because the man sets the tone. So patriarchy is ruled by fathers is just the core of the whole thing. So what I'm or just me is, on Twitter. You don't yeah, okay. I I didn't get a, a girl on Twitter. I was well, I was just like, um what's up with all these floozies? <laughs> not, <laughs> not as good as a mother saying don't dress like a hoe, perhaps, but uh, you yeah. know, I was I was doing my best to intone uh uh glasses pushed down on the nose, uh, appropriate true <laughs> of a mother. And we need a, we need the mom to turn up and just get them by the ear with a rolling pin. 
And then yeah. some of the friends need to be at the sideline, like, what is she doing? Why is she dancing <laughs> like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. That's oh, man. Gross. Your mom you know, looks what gross. <laughs> what I'm hearing from that, Will, is we got to shame the men to weaponize their chastity, to stop being weak, to start taking their roles uh, seriously. And then by virtue of that downstream from that, you're going to get this shaming of women through other women because we're going to set the standard. So again, comes back to us, doesn't it? So we're not at fault, but we're still responsible. Mm -hmm. well, and how do you shame guys better than being just like absolute chads? You know, like but chads men... in a marriage that bear fruit in those marriages and say, hey, listen, I'm not sleeping around and look at the tr look at look at the my tree of life, the the, the fruit that it bears versus yours. Sure. Or That's even sing like even single guys just being being excellent mm -hmm. in in their domains. Right. They're they're physically fit. They're articulate. They're they're making decent money. They're doing something meaningful with their lives. And then they're also saying, by the way, I'm saving myself for marriage and just keep hammering that point until it gets until you have the opposite of Andrew Tate and he can just look at the other guys and just scoff and, and turn up his nose and everyone goes like, y you slept with how many girls? That's disgusting. You're a degenerate. My, my icon, the guy that I look to on Twitter, on YouTube, on whatever, uh, he's saving himself for marriage. How lucky is that wife going to be? Like, we just need to hammer that as hard as possible for the next five years. And I think we'll see the tide turn. Got to bring the vol cell energy back. And bring marriage forward. Bring it yep. fast, like age 19 to 22 or so. That guy should be thinking, I'm getting married around then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. If there's one thing I would have changed, I would have got I would have got married a whole lot earlier. But it's okay. The next generation, we can correct this. Gentlemen, this was a fantastic conversation as usual. Um, obviously, to everybody listening, share this with somebody. We're never going to charge for this podcast, right? I say it on my other podcast too. Just pay it forward. That's the fee. Leave a comment. God bless you guys. Love you, dudes. Thanks, you guys, dude. Love you guys. Great to see you guys. Take care. And Bye. seem ask homework. Bye. If your if your wife wears yoga pants outside the home, get her to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs>